Many people think that dealing with difficult customer situations is a matter of being quote unquote nice people with a quote unquote good attitude. To me, difficult customer situations and customer service in general is a matter of specific communications techniques based on known principles of behavioral psychology that dramatically change the way that people react to you, especially in difficult situations. One of the great things about call centers is that you get to monitor people's phone calls and it's an accepted business practice. And so one day I'm listening to a phone call with one of our agents who's talking to a woman who was using our very complex software package and had never had the required training for it and had made some mistakes that had messed up her invoices going back for months. And it was going to take hours and hours of work to fix that up. She wasn't very happy about that. In fact, she was demanding that we fly somebody to New York the next day to fix the problem. Now, this agent was very kind and very patient, and I thought he was doing a good job with her. And so I signed off the call and went back to work. Ten minutes later, he showed up in my office, and I said, Dave, you did a great job with that woman. And he looks at me and says, she's still on the line. She wants to talk to you. She still wants somebody to fly to New York. Here's what I said to this customer. I said, Marilyn, I understand you're having a problem. What can I do to help you, just like you did? So I started in a safe place. Predictably, she responded by saying, your stupid software messed up all my invoices and you need to fly somebody to New York. Now we reach what I call the oh my god moment. And what I did, again, very similar to what both of you were doing, I acknowledged and validated everything that she said, which is, I can tell you're really frustrated about this and this is a lot of work. And I have good news for you. I can fly somebody to New York. Now, I do want you to be aware that it costs about, it, there's a lead time of three weeks to have somebody come on site, and it costs about $3,000. I don't want to spend $3,000. Of course you don't. So I want to see what I can do to help you for free right here on the telephone. So over the course of a 10-minute conversation, I never said no to her. I never told her she should have been trained. I did not fly anybody to New York. And we left this phone call as friends with us helping her on the phone and with her talking to one of our salespeople for a training intervention. And that's the kind of outcome that I want you folks to have. But what's even more important is that within six months, anybody on my team would have handled that phone call exactly the same way. Why do people leave call centers? It's because they don't know how to talk to this guy. <laughs> what happens is that obviously you train people to know your product. You train people to be polite. I'm sure you all have very talented staffs. You have good infrastructure since you're all parenture users, but people get that deer frozen the headlight moment when they're facing this guy. And the point I want to make is with the right kind of training and more importantly, the right kind of coaching, people can understand this as procedural skills because customer service and customer support is fundamentally about people with problems. People with problems are no fun. Paraphrase what the other person says before you reply. And one of the interesting things about paraphrasing is Many call centers, particularly those who aren't as familiar with North American culture as others, have been trained to repeat what the other person says word for word, and sometimes that makes people angrier. And the reason is, the more you take somebody's thoughts, replay them in your own words and hand them back, the more you're sending a signal to the other person that you hear them, you understand them, and it's safe to talk about it. And they know you're not just following a script, you're present with them. Then the next thing is to share your knowledge of the situation. Some people think that service means being humble and servile, and this ties in with what you were saying in the back, which I totally agree with, which is when you share the knowledge of the situation um, as to why things are going on or what's happening, that gives people that warm, fuzzy feeling that they've come to the right place to be helped. Then the next thing is active feedback. Feedback is a very important and very procedural skill that will change the dynamics of especially your most difficult situations. And then finally summarize the understanding that people have, how you deliver bad news to people. This is one of the one or two things that I want you to come away with. It's a technique called staging. It's a three-step process. And the first step is to first introduce what you're going to say before you say it. That's why I chose the response that I did. Because there's no one all-purpose introduction. But if you say anything that prepares people for the fact that you're about to tell them something important, you're lessening the negative impact of it. Then the next step is to explain the reasons or the details for what you're saying as you're saying it. And then the third one, and this is the most important one, is to empathize with somebody no matter what they're saying after you've said it. This is probably best explained by example. Let's say I take my car in to get fixed 
and it has what seems to be a minor rattle on the dashboard. And I call at the end of the day and they say, uh, yeah, Mr. Gallagher, we looked at your car, it's gonna cost $800 to fix it. How am I gonna react to that? What? <laughs> I'm gonna have a lot of shock and anger and annoyance, and I'm gonna take that out at the person at the other end of the phone. But now let's try it again with staging. Yes, Mr. Gallagher, we took a look at your car, and because it's what appeared to be a minor rattle on the dashboard, we were hoping this would be a minor repair. Unfortunately, and unfortunately is a great word to use when you're staging, it turned out to be something more serious than that. Now I move to step two and explain the details. You may be aware, Mr. Gallagher, that your car has an airbag system because you have a late model car. And airbags tend to be self-contained systems where if anything goes wrong, we have to replace the entire module. And they tend to be fairly expensive repairs. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask how much it costs and they're gonna tell me it's $800. Now question for you guys, am I happy? No, I am not happy. Am I angry at the person at the other end of the phone? Probably not, and that's the value of using a technique. Now we're going to move to step three. I'm probably going to respond emotionally to that and say, wow, that's two weeks pay for me. That's a lot of money. Most people are going to say, I'm sorry, sir. This is what these repairs cost, and I'm afraid we don't have any other options than that. But that's not what I want you to say. What I want you to say is, you're right. That is a lot of money. I'd be frustrated if I were in a situation like this, too. Would you like to talk to one of our technicians and see what your options are? And that's how you get through the situation. Staging is one of the hardest skills for people to feel natural about using. And in my experience, it takes a matter of weeks, maybe months before everybody does it. But here's what's really important. With enough coaching, eventually everybody does get it and everybody does start using it. And when they do, it's magical to hear what happens. And that's when you start changing your metrics and that's when you start changing your service performance. So the reason that staging works is that you're giving people information, you're helping them understand why there's a problem, but you're also adding some of yourself into the equation, letting them know that you're doing whatever you can to advocate for them. Change the wording of what you're gonna say when you agree to something. People are gonna be asking you things all day in a support center. You're going to say yes or no. You're gonna do no more work depending on the yes or the no that you use. Choose a phrase that fits your personality that cranks up the amount of enthusiasm, cranks up the amount of interest, and cranks up the good feelings when you say yes to somebody and see what happens when you start using it. And this is how, again, you acknowledge the agenda. Good acknowledgements are your key to defusing difficult customer situations. The lowest octane level is observation. You're not putting any of your own emotions into it. You're just observing how the other person's feeling. So a good observation statement would be, I can tell you're really frustrated about that. I can see by your tone of voice this is important to you. Even that lowest level of acknowledgement is better than nothing, which is what most people do. The next octane level of acknowledgement is validation, where you're letting people know that their feelings are valid. And so there you're using phrases like, nobody likes to have to pay their taxes on April 15th. Everybody hates it when this happens. Your experience is very normal. Lots of people make this mistake. The next octane level and the highest octane level is identification, where you're putting your own personality and your own feelings into it, where you say, I would get frustrated if that happened to me. And so I understand how you feel. When you tell somebody that they did something wrong, they're always going to push back or feel like pushing back. That's a survival instinct. When you say, I've done something stupid, they learn from watching you and they don't get defensive. And so that's what's very important about that. You can't always choose the highest octane level. When somebody says, I was so mad about this computer problem that I smashed my cup against the wall, you can't say, well, when I get that mad, I smash my cup against the wall, too. So choose the right octane level, but the higher the octane level you go, the better people feel. When is it okay to say no to somebody? When they're making an unrealistic demand? When they want you to take responsibility for something that's their fault? Anytime you can, cannot give them what they want, or never ever? My choice is D, never ever. And one of the things I actually make people write down in live training is never ever say no. And again, the reason for it is, social cognition, which is that when you say no to somebody, they always push back or feel like pushing back. That doesn't mean being disingenuous and faking what you can or can't do. What it means is instead of focusing on what you can't do, you focus on what you can do. Um, and so the two parts of it, of responding to that is what I call the can-can, which is always respond with what you can acknowledge, and that acknowledgement is critical, and then what you can do. So instead of saying, I'm not the right person to fix this, you can say, 
I can put you in touch with the right person. Instead of saying it's the end of my shift, that's something you should never ever say in a support environment. Instead of I can't give you a refund, I work with a lot of retailers, I can give you a discount or I can show you some other options like re-gifting or I can give you a gift wrap. We can't possibly do that, turns into let's look at the options.